Okay, please welcome David Hudson from Down Under and from the International Project Management Association. That's it. Thank you. Well, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Look, I'd like to start with three moments of truth before I even commence any of the technical part of the program. The first moment of truth, I have to say, is about me. Um, I'm an Australian. Okay, my partner Mary is with me, enjoying Dallas. But the truth is, the photograph in the program is old. Okay, yep, that's the truth. Okay, it's a fact. Here's a second fact, and it's for the ladies in the audience, and it's about Hugh Jackman. You know Hugh Jackman? The, yeah, okay. I'm, I had to bring a message from the women in Project Management Australia. You cannot keep him. You have to send him back eventually. Okay. Look, the third point is actually the truth. The third point is actually the truth. Uh, I have been uh, in my own professional association, the Australian Institute of Project Management, uh, six years on the board and two years as the national president. I'm currently a Vice President with the International Project Management Association. Now, we operate a framework which is uh, different to PMI. Some people say that's competition. I don't. I just say we're, we're in the same field. The point is this, if anybody ever feels uncomfortable, because I will be making some points about IPMA. If anybody ever feels uncomfortable, and so on one occasion a gentleman approached me who was uncomfortable and said to me, David, you know, I, I have to admit I'm part of the PMI. I said, so what? Look, I don't care what Kool-Aid county you go to at the end of the day. The Kool-Aid all came, comes from the same source of water. The fact that we, whatever church of project management we go to, whatever Kool-Aid you know, part we go to, we're doing the right thing. We're, we're following our professional practice. So that's, the, that's one of the points I wanted to make. Now, why do I present this paper? They don't grow on trees. Oh. If I go ahead, it'll say that. It's because in my practice of developing project management organisations and developing project management professionals, I've, I learned about a decade ago, give up the hard yards of frontline project management. I did that. So now I'm practising on the profession. When companies come to me and say, hey, David, we're desperate for three senior project managers and two project engineers, and uh, by the way, uh, can you provide uh, you know, a project controls officer? Just now, and I say, absolutely. I just went past a coffee shop, and they were sitting there waiting, not for any company, for yours. They were waiting for you, they were waiting for this moment, and they had their seat, you've got the joke. See, my frustration is, they don't grow on trees. But my experience is, and I'm, I'm, in, I'm encouraged by hearing so much of the positive practice of some companies who are doing the right thing. But others don't. Others don't get it. And this, this paper came out of frustration more than anything else of trying to encourage people to understand, particularly organisations, of the need to, to get ahead. You know, the, the, the need to be better and the need to develop our own professional body of project managers. Now, I've got to thank Bill Moylan because a lot of, the, you know, and other speakers yesterday, <laughs> He's preempted a lot of what I had to say, and I think we'll be reinforcing each other's comments enormously. So that's the purpose of the paper. Now, Stacey Goff, you felon, you stole this line yesterday in your paper. Imagine a world where all projects succeed. Now, that's one of the mantras of the IPMA strategy 2020. Now, it's, it, and as Stacey said yesterday, it is possible, more so it must be done. Because when we realise that something in the order of 33% of the world GDP, something like a third of the world economy, is enabled or delivered through projects, it's non-negotiable. When we start working in figures of that nature, we realise that an incremental increase or decrease in our project management capacity and the effect on the results of projects is, is critically important. So it has to be done. Now, I'm just going to mention two factors about us before I get into the agenda. The first is, and this slide, the, the stats are a little old, uh, but I just haven't captured any more recently, but fundamentally we do recognise that the one trend, one of the trends that's occurring particularly through young professionals is the de development of aspirational project managers. So the figures have changed, if I snap them again, 
the, the movement would be profound. I've got to point out this here. See, I'm from Australia. No, that won't work. Here it is. See there. See, I'm from Australia, but actually born in the state of Tasmania. Now, I guess there's a comparison here in the US, but, you know, it's sort of the joke of the rest of the country. So I always say, I figure, I'm trying to figure that blip, and I think it's Tasmania. <laughs> and, and, but the, what the slide says, there is a change. I mean, I'm an accidental project manager. My first career was in the military. I spent a nanosecond there, just 30 years in the Corps of Infantry, you know, causing mayhem. And I left my last job uh, working in the Asian region, being the Asian specialist in jungle warfare, to running the procurement of $300 million of payroll and HR systems for, the, for my state government. I'll slow down a bit now, by the way. I realise I'll probably get into my Australian gabble. So I was the accidental project manager. I went, oh, my God. What are we doing? I walked in. What are we doing? Oh, we got a Gantt chart here. I said, that's great. Okay. No, I, I was a little more aware of project management, the truth, but I, you know, I was an accidental project manager. By comparison, our son and my daughter, our daughter, is, is uh, our aspirational project manager. He is a project manager. She is undertaking her master's in project management next year. Heaven help us. What a family. There is on, the, on the, the state council of the Australian Institute of Project Management. We can't get away from it. But, but that's, that's a feature, feature. And, and another feature is, um, is we're professionalising. I want to check we've got the slides up. We are professionalising. So if there's any problem in the human capital component, it's essentially not through us. We're here doing our bit. The pitch that I'm making in this paper is to organisations. It's it's okay that individuals are making their plans. I heard Bill ask there before, are organisations sending you here or are you here of your own volition? And I expect that there is a mixture between us. So, you know, that's us. So the, the agenda I'm presenting is really about the organisations. Now, I'm going to stay with this, this uh, agenda. As I would say in Espanol, muscle, muscle menos, okay, more or less. Trust me, I'm an Australian. Uh, I will stick with the agenda, more or less, okay. But I'd like to start by asking a few questions. I think that it's, it's the interactive, as Bill said. So can I ask, first of all, some questions? If I asked you the question, who will manage your organization's projects next year or even next month, in terms of resource planning, could I have an indication if you think your company is particularly good at resource planning? Okay. Come on. Come on. Somebody give me a break, okay? Uh, very lousy. Not so good. And in the middle? Yeah, okay. Can I ask the second question again to your organisation? Um, are you good at identifying and resolving competency or experience gaps in a systematic way? So do you approach project management development from a formal systematic competency development way? How many, how many here are working for organisations that are good at that? Okay. Stacey. Very poor, not so many, just a few, and uh, in the middle, which is probably pretty fair. Thank you. Now, how many of you who have worked in organisation know that your organisation is measuring the success and measuring the input that comes from professional development? Are there anybody in the room? Is anybody here with your company is actually you realise that you're formally measuring the success of your project management development? Not at all? A few, not at all? Okay. okay. There's some of the things we'll talk about, and I'll keep an eye on the time as well. Okay. I just want to bring up the baseline from my own organisational maturity studies, because that's one of the baselines I use to to uh, to advise organisations, as many do, as Dennis and, and Daryl were talking yesterday in baselining. I do a similar thing. Using uh, Baldridge or the Australian Business Excellence Framework, I'm going to present two pictures uh, just from the area of strategic, strategic human resource planning. Now, the factor here, you, I'll, look, I'll do them both, I'll run back again, is three is just the baseline. Three is not get to good, three is just get to go. So what we have as a baseline is measuring organisations, you know, a range of series of questions. The questions are a little different. If you were really quick, you would have picked up. They go to the same point. I've just reworded them in, in a couple of uh, iterations of this study, but fundamentally, when I ask organisations, how good are you at your strategic human resource management, the answer is generally average or worse. Now that scares the heck out of me because, uh, you know, 
I ask the question from a quality perspective. Uh, would you would you bring substandard materials and services into your projects? No. No, no, we've got quality procedures for that. Do you generally prefer to measure the data in your cost and schedule estimating? Well, we know we're not, we know, except when we're using Stacey's pen, the estimating pen. Other than that, you know, that's, that can be a bit hit or miss, but we try. We at least understand the importance of that. But when we ask the question, how do you, how do you measure the quality? Do you make an effort at, at, at understanding the quality of your people, the quality of your resources, and, and consistently measuring that? And it's a bit tricky, because the answer in that's not all that solid. So that's the baseline, and that's where I would like to see the improvement. I would fundamentally like to see that graph up in the four. So that's using the standard, uh, some, some use the term Kurtzman maturity scale. In fact, you know, Dr. Harold Kurtz is probably, I don't know he, whether he wants us to use that term. It's a fairly generic maturity model. Uh, I'd like to see that in the scale of one to five, pitching up into four at least, not hanging down at three and below. So what I'm going to talk to now is, um, how do people fit into the enterprise project management framework? And this is picking up on a lot that was said yesterday. Well, firstly, if I can go to what I would initially, in my consulting, I talked about three traditional elements. And to be honest, if I do a trip back into, in, in, in a little journey, and I joined Project Management Land in about 1995, 96, remember, PMBOK version one printed, Bill, Bill pushed that out, as you said, Stacey. Uh, Australia published its first competency standard in 1996. So we were really talking then, frankly, we were talking about really that. And we started to talk about that. And we started to talk about that in about 2000. So in about the year 2000, we started, I worked for a boss who was really great, a thought leader in Australia. And at that stage, my, my mentor, a gentleman called Colin Doby, who was himself then the national president of the Australian Institute of Project Management, he was saying, Portfolios, programs, and PMOs don't leave home without them. Now that message, that's a resounding message that's been coming through here. So that's the picture there. But look, I've realized that the model's not complete. The model needs completion with, fundamentally, from a governance perspective, if we're talking about maturity level four, we, we must be engaged and interested uh, in the governance of the data. So seamless flows of data is important, so I put that in the enterprise model. But now, a great feature that's been the subject of so many papers is this. Enterprise project management, particularly if we're driving at maturities level four and five, you just can't get there without culture. And if you don't have a view on culture, then you won't sustain it. And I'll come back to that point a little later when I talk about a little game that I'm familiar with. So that's a factor there. Now, the point, because this paper is supposed to be about people is, Look, the reality is people just aren't an element of that on the human capital side. People are intrinsic to that. People are intrinsic to that. So we, we, are, we, just, we are hardwired into this model. So getting, you know, it's getting that, that message across to organisations. <clears throat> if you focus on systems and tools and data and all that stuff, that's great. But you not just have to look at your people as a human capital component, but you have to look at your people and your organisational culture as key enablers of project maturity. Now, I'd just like to move on and talk about competency. Um, now, for me, it's a formal concept. You know, I, from a kid, I was 19. This is the tie that I graduated with from my office. I didn't quite graduate with this, otherwise it'd be a bit dirty. Uh, this is from my graduating school at the Office of Cadet School. I was hardwired into competency from, not, from, any, yeah, from age 19, so it's not a new concept to me. What does it mean? Well, it's about, a, you know, you can define it anyway, but I'd put it as the ability to perform a role or task successfully, and we would generally in the military put prescribed conditions to say what conditions should the person be able to do that. And it's not just about knowledge. This is the scary aspect for me is so many organisations, and perhaps I... Look, I, forgive me if I appear to veer on the negative. Perhaps I should spin it into the positive a bit. I would be delighted to see organisations look at competency from a much more mature perspective and not just knowledge. Send them to school. But send them to school is part of it. Or self-learning, however you go about it. But it's also skills and attitude. And if I put that to you this way, um, if a person is a carpenter, 
Sure. A skill, you know, to cut a joint in, in the wood. That's a skill. Knowledge about wood types and knowledge about the tools is important. But if that carpenter doesn't have an attitude, fundamentally committed to a quality output, then, you know, all the rest is just, you know, superfluous. Take it from our perspective, a risk manager, for example. A risk manager may be proficient, may have the skill of developing a risk register, but fundamentally, or a project manager applying risk management. But if they don't understand, I would consider it standard professional knowledge to know the Pimlock components. See, I, I profess it readily. I am from the AIPM and the IPMA, but I'm a, I'm a, I'm a strong supporter of the ideas to, that are espoused in Pimlock. Or in ISO 31000, the international standard. I would expect a professional project manager to have that knowledge. But above all that, if that person doesn't fundamentally commit to the value of risk management in managing the uncertainty in projects, then again, the rest of it's surplus. So that's what's got to be developed. This aspect of the three, the three components of competency. And the difference, um, this is a bit of a tired old side for some, but you know, fundamentally, uh, let's just put these propositions up. I think they speak for themselves. You know, fundamentally, the difference in competency is the measurement of performance. Now, this is a mantra that my, my good friend, I, I can say my good friend Bill Duncan uh, professes a lot because he is, he's just mad on developing performance standards through various methods. So, but we've moved on. We did focus on the technical, and again, I'm delighted to see so many papers here talking now about the components of behavioural and business. You know, we realise that once we get beyond basic project management, and we were talking about the business yesterday with Dennis and Darrell. Fantastic. Thank you. Because project managers must be focused on the business, and we must have the interpersonal skills. Now, this relates, in the IPMA terms, uh, to what we call the eye of competence, uh, behavioural, technical, and, uh, and uh, contextual. So these are the areas under the IPMA standard. And again, I said it's delightful to see the PMI now moving and expanding the concept under the PMBOK and through PMP into a much broader, uh, much broader span, because that's fantastic. It's just essential. Now, I might put in a bit of a plug here that this ICB, this is from ICB version 4, so the inter International Competence Baseline, it will be the IPMA Baseline version 5. Um, I acted as a program manager for that for a couple of years, and Bill Duncan worked uh, with me as the project manager on the uh, competence baseline project. It's fun working with Bill. He's, he's a very interesting guy, uh, and you know, a lot of ideas. We also express it as a periodic table for any of the chemists in the room, so we, uh, we actually put it this way, to, you know, so that we actually lay this out. We try and get, you know, we try and get people to get it, you know, try and get it, that the, competence, the, the, the aspect of competency is broader than just the technical components. Now, if I could use a, getting ahead of myself here, sorry, to go back to that, the, the, uh, the, the uh, periodic table. So that's, and I'd imagine, you know, you don't get much change out of this when you, you, know, you look at these, you, you may debate some of them, uh, but they are important. I, when we first uh, encountered IPMA, in fact, to, and I can say with honesty, Mary and I introduced IPMA to Australia because we, we attended the Rome conference in two, 2008. Now, that was a hard chore, but we did that out of our own interest and realised that it was, uh, it was important and that Australia needed to be part of the broader enterprise. But I, I looked at this, and to be honest, I was sceptical. I, I wondered how hard-nosed Australian project managers would look at relaxation and openness. If you say to a project manager, how relaxed are you? And they'd say, are you crazy? <laughs> but the spin is when you reverse it and say, I'm not suggesting that you have to be supremely relaxed as a project manager. I'm not suggesting that you can have absolute open, uh, openness in a hard dollar project. I'm not crazy. But in the converse, if you're not relaxed, if you're tense, and if you're so closed to your client and your other stakeholders that you were a mystery box, then it's not going to work. So, in fact, we found that these, the, all of the aspects in the, in the uh, competence baseline are now highly accepted in the Australian context, and it was a little surprise to me. 
Now, I'm going to use a bit of a case study, and I will come back to this in more detail later from a mine. Now, this is about mining, so I gave you a fairly subtle hint here. This is actually the, uh, the, copper, the copper mine at Escondida in Chile, um, one of the biggest copper mines in the world. So uh, through that, in my work with the company that runs that, back in about 2009, I'll show you some of the work that we did, because it's, in my opinion, the best example of a human resource, a human capital development strategy. So independently, and I must say, to be honest, this was before my encounter with IPMA, that BHP Billiton, one of the largest resources companies in the world, selected the, this broader model to support their own competency framework. So you can see we were using, and they took the view, uh, they said we, we like the idea of technical, but we want to bond the pinbock elements in as the technical components because, frankly, the 21 elements or so in the IPMA model were a little bit complex for them. <coughs> not, not complex in themselves, just having 21 elements was a complexity. They, built, they took the contextual and laid their own stuff on it, and they combined their own uh, leadership attribute uh, model in with the, with the IPMA framework. And we developed, I'll go through the process with you, I'll show you uh, the framework we developed and some of the products that we, 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 uh, we used, or some of the, some of the systems we used. Uh, to measure competency worldwide in the world's largest resources company. But that was the framework and it was, inter it was just interesting that they landed on that all on their own. I'll come back to that and I'll show you the full case study. So, what I'd like to talk about now with you is just a little about um, just competency. Once we understand it becomes a very powerful tool. And, you know, I, I, I'll put it in the positive. I would be delighted to see companies understanding that the proper use of competency is, can lead to some very rich results. Now, first of all, if I just put up a basic, you know, you can, you, I, I would call this a basic human resource cycle. You may debate that if you're a human resource expert. I'm, this is not my core area of expertise, but I would say competency, if we're talking from a project management perspective, Competency is intrinsic to all of these. If we, if we are willing to commit to a competency structure, then we can base the organisation design on that structure. We can use competency standards as the basis of recruitment and selection. We can focus on the gaps that a person may have from a competency perspective in the induction. We can develop and manage people using competency as the core framework for that. And you know, I'll talk about this, we can actually let people, even letting people go, I know it's a bit of a tricky term, and, and it, but you know, competency can play a role in that. I'll talk to a couple of elements of this. Just last year, um, I undertook a consulting assignment with a large uh, energy company in Brisbane. Uh, it was a relatively small group of people, only 21 practitioners, but they comprised project managers of three levels, so junior, senior and strategic. Uh, business analysts at two levels and also business intelligence analysts and a whole group of solution architects. And what I found from an organisational design perspective was it was a mess. It was an absolute mess. Because of the overlaps in those competencies, particularly the overlap between project manager and BA on one hand and business analysts and solution architects on the other, it was very confused. And one of the problems that the organisation had was there was no clarity um, in how they resolved the overlap in the role and what function each of those people would play in particular projects. And so it certainly wasn't systematic. And part of our advice to the company was, sort it out. It's not hard. And guess what? Your project, your staff actually don't care what call you make. They actually said that. They said, we don't care if they take that role from me and give it to the business analyst. But you make it clear in the organisational design. And, and that was an important part that that, organi that, that organisation took away and are acting on. Uh, I'll just talk briefly in view of time on divestment. It, look, it's a little tragic. It's, it's, I'd say, I'd use the term interesting, but frankly tragic. But I was delivering a program to one of my clients only four weeks ago in uh, Adelaide, which is on the, 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 we know with a boomerang down the bottom of the country. It looks like a boomerang with the, with the, gulf, of, uh, the gulf at the bottom. Uh, Adelaide sits more or less in the centre of the country on that south coast. Now, as it would be, I was delivering a two-day program on project leadership, 
uh, leadership theories, motivation, project human resource management, change management and stakeholder management. The company was divesting themselves of staff while I was running the program. I had class members <coughs> moving out of the class for a half hour to find that they had been redundant. I have to say it put a different perspective on Maslow and Hertzberg during those presentations. So but the irony was that program I'd been running for them for an, a, a, as a national and global client uh, for a number of years, a nine-day program, could easily have led to a diploma of project management, but very few students had taken it up. But guess what? The wheel turned, and more than half of that class has called upon me now, because in the process of divestment, in the process of leaving the company, they've seen the benefit of getting a formal accreditation from their, from their project management skills from that. Now, I'd just like to pitch it now again, and I think this is a theme that was well and truly dealt with a number of papers yesterday. Uh, is there a link, he said, he asked the question, is there a link between human capital and organisational maturity? Now, I'm putting up a basic model here. You could, you could again, I'm sure you've got your own version and may, may differ a little in, in detail, but this is essentially as I see it. Level one, forget it, nothing's happening. There are no standards here. Level two, organisations are trying. There's evidence of a methodology, uh, but it's, it's uh, inconsistently used for a whole variety of reasons. And, and, you know, I call it planned because when it is used, it's generally used at the planning stage and not much else. Uh, managed as at project level when we see, as I say to my clients, reasonable consistency, reasonable consistency. Uh, in the use of the methodology across projects. Of course I would expect to see variations according to project scale and particular project circumstances. Level four is integrated, which to me is when governance comes into play. When program and at the higher, higher end of, the, of this particular phase, portfolio management comes into play and absolutely fundamentally with the assistance of PMOs. And level five, optimised as a learning organisation. The, the interesting thing here is that when I started my work in this area, uh, three was the glass ceiling. You know, that was it. Get to three, that's good. Uh, you know, it was very frustrating because why should we limit ourselves at that? It is actually really encouraging, particularly hearing through the papers here and in my practice elsewhere, to see that organisations have got it. You just can't stop at three. And by the way, you don't have to develop three and then develop four, they can be occurring in parallel. So that you can actually, we can now, one, advice to one of my clients earlier this year, uh, a regional local government in Queensland is, for sure you've got work to do in cementing your level three behaviour, but don't wait for that to be complete before you develop your governance layers. It will be too late. Put those things in place, fast track that process, and start to put elements of maturity level four in place at the same time, and it will work. <coughs> and we've said to them as well, you can really aspire to being a level five organisation if you want to, but you have to want to, because it's essentially cultural. And that's the big, the big cultural aspect that comes out. Now, is that linked to human capital and learning? Fundamentally, absolutely fundamentally. Because re realistically, I find that you know, in the ad hoc type of organisation, frankly, people people are more or less educating themselves, if at all, at that level. It's all at an individual level. Basic induction training, practical project skills workshop will support level two. Formal project management level training and certification at level three. And I say certification, I'll come back to later. Why do I say certification? I'll come back to that when we talk about measuring the results of benefits of the investment in learning and development. This is the scary bit, but fortunately, luckily now, of course, we, have, we all have standards, so many standards being developed. If I could just talk to my own professional body, um, we formally now have portfolio, program and project management standards. Unfortunately, at the moment, no PMO standards and no sponsor level standards, although I do believe Bill Duncan's working on that as a standard over gaps. The scary thing is this, um, you know, I, I, it just comes out every time in my corporate programs. Train the heck out of the project manager until they finally come to me and say, David, David, look, it's terrific. The 
It's a sign of obscure reason. They seem to like the training. You know, they must be, uh, they must be simple people. But it's, I say that nicely. Um, but they realise the frustration of saying, but do you realise we're getting, you know, we, we use that term glass ceiling again. We're hitting the roof because our pro program managers, our sponsors, our portfolio managers are essentially uneducated. So this level of education is fundamental. If we do not develop our program with portfolio managers, we simply can't advance into level four. We can't do it effectively. It will all be, it will all be difficult. So that's happening. And the remarkable thing is we're all developing standards in that area, which is great, and educational products. But getting to five, um, you know, that's cultural. I'll, again, I'll deal with that a little later. I've got another uh, presentation on getting what I call getting the good. And that's, this is the bit of cultural. But it can be done. Look, the bottom line here is it's not, here I put the point, it's not just about the training of project managers. It's about the education in various ways of people at all levels. And if we aspire to a learning organisation, we need to understand that we're going on a change and a cultural journey, and it involves knowledge management, but it can be done. It's not impossible. We just have to take the fear out of organisations that it's somehow really, really difficult. So what I'd like to do now um, is just share with you uh, a, the journey with uh, BHP Billet. I can use it freely. It was a good program. Uh, and it's certainly the longest uh, lasting human capital program that I've had the pleasure of being involved in. The sad thing is that many are so short lived. We start on the journey, uh, <coughs> get people fired up, and within, a, within several years, the, the organisations lost the, the, the intensity of interest in, in the learning cycle. So, but this has been different. Uh, these are just some scenes from, the, uh, from part of the uh, project in, in Chile. This was laying a pipeline, a, a desalination plant, 186 kilometres of pipeline up to Escondida through the driest desert in the world. <coughs> the program started, the guy on the top right is Marius Kloppers. Now he's not the CEO of the organisation anymore and uh, he was a pretty fearsome CEO. But his question to his, to, at, now the mining industry's changed of course. Now this is one of the frustrating factors. The economy changes and it changes the whole dimension. When the company was in full thrust, they had a, a 90 billion, I'll say that again, 90 billion dollar project pipeline. Marius asked his executive staff whether they had the project human capital to support the pipeline. Simple question, would you think? Simple question? We're about to deliver, we are in the process of delivering 90 billion dollars in projects. Do we have the human capital? And the answer was, we don't know. Now, strangely enough, you might find this a funny reaction from the chief executive officer, but he wasn't satisfied with that answer. <laughs> so the project that I undertook was to assist the company in developing a human capital framework, um, a skills assessment program, and then the development program to support that. It was a great program. Now this gentleman here, Mark Boats, he was the project VP of project services at the time. He's now running the I uh, forget the, the actual name, schools at the University of Sydney, a school for project management leadership. A great man. Uh, and he led the program. He was great. So uh, the idea was we wanted to support, you know, their wide variety of projects. I could move through these quickly. The, one of the challenges was recognising the fact that uh, at, you know, various project types, a mere $2 billion and above, you know, can we develop a framework that would support these people? So we did. Uh, one of the first products that we did was, uh, strangely enough, for the first time in the company, was to lay out a, a, um, uh, a career profile. I said, David, can you lay out a career profile for project managers they moved through? They said, I could draw a chart. So we drew, we drew this, and with, in all fairness, uh, the company wanted this to look at. Uh, we, we set out how, how it might be developed, and we put some common pathways uh, but to be perfectly honest, once we'd done that, and I'd laid it out for the company, uh, we all reached the agreement that, frankly, that was good. Um, it satisfied part of the project deliverables and it gave a basic framework, but fundamentally, things are significantly more complex than that. And people find their own pathways. So it was nice, 
but I would suggest you wouldn't hang your hat on that as being the only way that people develop. Uh, we developed a process which was really rigorous. The clients will say to me, David, can you do skills audits on, on my staff? And, yes, I can. Um, then the next thing is, can you do it really rigorously, very cheaply? You, no, that's, you know, funny about that? A client wanting it really rigorously, very cheaply. And I say, now, there's a little discussion we have to have here. <laughs> we have to have a chat. Because you can't, uh, quite frankly. And I'll be clear with clients and say, I'd be happy to give your staff a self-assessment uh, instrument. Uh, generally, I do it online, uh, which they can do with some briefing. And by objectivizing the questions, we can make the process as objective as you reasonably can. So you can get some results from that. Um, or we can go through to an interview-based program at the top end, and we can even get referrals. So the, the process we used was that um, I would typically line up in Australia or in Chile and deal with about four project managers a day. They would sit and self-assess on, on a system that was really sophisticated. They would answer a series of online questions and said, don't worry, because after you've answered the questions, I will just really for an hour in a one-on-one -on -one interview straight after that. So I would then spend most of the rest of the day uh, interviewing those four or five people. Um, five was a real mess. I find that uh, I can do four competence interviews in a day. Uh, the fifth one, I wondered whether, you know, I don't know whether I interviewed a squirrel. So it's a bit tricky. But that was the program we followed. And we even had a manager review. So it was a 360 degree review and quite good. Uh, gave us good results. And it produced this sort of thing. Uh, you've seen this in your psychology interview? You know, what is that? I don't know. It's like a rat. Uh, we produced this. So what you can see here is the elements of the competency framework were, re were replicated here. And we gave the individual a rating from one to five. Uh, and three was about average. Um, and we could see from this person's profile where they needed competency development. It worked really well. I have to say to you frankly, when we did the risk assessment of this program, when we looked at all sorts of factors, logistic, talent, yada, yada, the singular component that came out in the risk assessment was if they don't buy it, if they don't buy the principle that this is about professional development, not about performance management, then this program will die. And luckily, uh, we took that risk analysis, we, we acted on that, and we put in place a, a very thorough system. <coughs> Everything was in the communication. And we made it clear, and we, we, we absolutely drove this home, that it was about professional development. So to, to enable people to be more objective, I would say to them in the briefing, look, the answer is you, you can inflate your results, and you'll feel great. But most likely, you will miss out on professional development, because if we take your results seriously, then you'll miss out on the development. So I found, and I have to say, I probably, in, through this program, conducted in the order of 400 interviews in Australia, uh, in different, different parts of the world, and 98% um, of them have been really objective. <laughs> the odd person, you know, I should need to be honest with you, the odd person has really dug in, and that's been quite interesting. Um, but getting, you know, you can get to the bottom of that eventually. And we give, give them other results. It was a fairly rich platform. Normally, the system was great. It would produce these results uh, within a half an hour of the interviews, and I could uh, talk to the candidates. It was a really great process. But we understood, we then developed a, training, a, a, a professional development program. Um, I suppose I won't go into this at the busy level. If I summarised it overall, we'd say, you know, fundamentally, at level one and level two, we developed project management and project management plus type skills. But we really went into the areas of acumen at PM level three. Um, and um, had we advanced this, we didn't, and I'll be honest, we didn't advance this fully. We ran uh, a few pilot programs, but it's the one part in the program, uh, surprisingly again, didn't have as much traction as I would like. I would have had behavioural acumen in here as well. We decided at level five, it was two, levels four and five, it was too difficult to be prescriptive, because if we're talking about project managers at that level, um, my recommendation to the company was, that we base that on highly based on individual needs. And that would probably be outsourced uh, academic education to keep that flowing. The other aspect we, now with, with apologies to Sonny and Sonny and Sher, 
is it takes three, baby. Now, I know a few people in the audience will remember that, okay? It takes three, baby. Uh, the other aspect we developed from this program, and I'm um, very keen to advocate to all of my clients is, don't try and develop your project managers just through a formal learning program. And in fact, look at learning broadly, whether that's e-learning, based uh, you know, formal learning in the classroom, or self-teaching. Uh, but that learning process, that, that training component is not the only component. The bits that we build in, and I must say the way we demonstrated to the people taking part in the program was that the only product, those graphs I showed you would come up in the interview, they were purely for the interview. At the end of the process, the only product that would come from the system would be a professional development report that talked about what formal learning was clearly there from a knowledge component, where the individual would benefit from specific experience in some areas, and, uh, and where mentoring and coaching would come into play. And I would say but here, it's an interesting thing, because uh, I, I'm sure it's no secret to all of us in the room you know, the, this is you know, this gets into a fair area of complexity. You know, frankly, you know, you know, I deliver project management education, so I have to be careful. But fundamentally, if we would put too fine a point on it, that could be commoditized. Uh, it's difficult, particularly in here, because the experience has to be available. And every experience I've had of developing mentoring programs is it's a you know it's an in, it's a resource intensive activity, and do not. My, my advice to companies is do not do mentoring and coaching on an ad hoc basis. Mentors need to be supported. We need a mentoring and coaching framework with guidelines, and mentors and mentees need to know what's going. It needs to be a planned, managed, and measured process in coaching and mentoring. But that will produce the, the genuine article. OK. I'm, and I'm actually doing not so bad on timing, so we'll still have time for questions. Now, that was the program we put in place, and that worked really very well. Now, if I go back, I think, to make a general analogy, it's not, it's not completely true, but in general terms. I would suggest that um, this focuses to a significant extent on the technical skills. The behavioural area, coaching and mentoring, plays a significant role. And in the contextual, that's knowledge of the company's business systems and that sort of thing, um, experience plays a big role. And I wasn't surprised to see a fairly strong correlation in the learning and development plans in that that's not, not, not completely, but to a large degree, that was the way that those various areas fell out in the professional development plans. Okay. Almost there. Two points, three. A little frustration is that, and I'll use the Australian context here, is that there is somewhat of a tendency to think that getting a PMP or becoming a certified practicing project manager with the Australian Institute of Project Management or an IPMA level C uh, or a diploma of project management, that's it. That's not it. That's the start point. For my, I'm sorry to say, you may disagree, I regard that as the baseline for professional development. When we're a practicing project manager, that's the, that's the start line. What seems to be missing, and what I try to advise them, is how, how do we go beyond that? How do we get to good? So I've taken a model that some of you may be familiar with in terms of uh, how, we, you know, how we go in our own journey of, of, uh, of development of competence. I'll, I'll use my own example. From the project management perspective, when I was in the military, um, frankly, I had. You know, I was aware, generally aware of the skill, but it was not on my radar. I was, uh, in general, un I, I was unconsciously incompetent. I didn't even think about the fact that I didn't have project management skills. I have to tell you that when I took over the role of the, uh, the project manager of the payroll and HR system uh, acquisition project for the Queensland government, a $300 million program, it sharpened my interest. And I was conscious. I was consciously incompetent. I realised that I had the need, I realised that there was a gap in my skills which I needed to develop. Now, some would debate this, uh, but I would say that I've probably taken the journey uh, now to the point where from a project management perspective, um, you know, it's now hardwired into, into my being, it's part of my DNA so that when I start a project I know, uh, you know, I've got to go back and get a charter. Um, I know that in the planning process, 
you know, don't go, don't leave home without a work breakdown structure. You know, those sorts of things are now in view. Now, so some may disagree, and, and you might even say for some of my project results, occasionally the odd kick in the face, maybe uh, I've still got some more to learn. What I'd like to do, though, is, you know, focusing on that sort of the frame. I'll just, that repeats the frameworks a little. I'll leave that. Really want to talk about how do we get to good? Because there is an enormous alignment between this, other papers, and other things I've said this morning. Getting to good is all part of developing the components of a learning organisation. How do we move on? Well, we move on by all sorts of methods. And I, you know, it, my, my, my uh, consultancy to companies emphasises the, <coughs> the fact that when they develop a project management framework, these sorts of things need to be put in place as well. I won't talk to them individually. You could read the attributes there, and I'm sure they ring a bell. How many of your organisations, can I get an indication how many of your organisations employ some of, some of these strategies um, under building the genuine article? Okay, so that's fairly predominant. That's, that's great. Okay. And it's certainly fundamental in developing uh, highly proficient project managers and developing the project management capability at all. And I would argue you can choose to disagree. I will never tell a lie to you. I'm an Australian. Okay? I would argue that you cannot develop a learning organisation. You cannot get to higher levels of project management maturity capability without these sorts of learning instruments. Okay. Now, <coughs> this is a bit I should shut up about. Because in my, in my part of practice in deli delivering project management education, I should just be fat and happy. Well, which am I now? Okay. Right. Okay. <coughs> I should just sit back and say, don't bother. Just treat training as a commodity. Buy it. And buy more. And buy more. But in truth, I try and and try and encourage uh, more mature clients to say, look, I, if you engage with me on a long-term professional development program, what I want with you is I want you to understand the measure of success from that investment you make in training. Now, one of the things I say is, first of all, um, you know, focus on these. What's the measure of success? What are our, in, in, our return on investment indicators we use? And uh, um, how do we fit this into the whole area of competence uh, frameworks? The reality is this. Uh, I need to oh, yes, go through that slowly. That was a terrific build in that PowerPoint slide. Look, one of the points I say to, you know, when clients say, David, David, could you take $100 off your daily price? And I look, I to get back and say, look, look, if it will win the gig, yes, that's fine. But what I'd like you to realise is the cost for me are a small proportion of the total cost of investment that you make. And when you consider things like the logistics of the training, and particularly your staff downtime, fiddling at the bottom line with a couple of dollars with your trainer is, is frankly irrelevant, because you, know, you need to factor the full costs. And what I'd like you to understand, even when we bundle those, is that when we take that cost... Now, what I did with this is, this is, I took with one organisation what I, what I projected, you know, I get crazy on Microsoft Excel, Excel from time to time, I factored the cost, all of the cost of training, and I projected that against the value of projects that would be driven. And I said, you know, you realise that while you're tinkering with all of that, we're talking about something that's a relatively small proportion of your, over, your, your overall project effort. So when you start to get fussy, about the cost of investment in training, you've got to measure it against this. But what's a reasonable investment? I don't know, Bill, what's a reasonable investment? I say to people, is it 1%? Is it 10% too much? Is 2% OK? You've got to figure it out. But please bear in mind that when you're factoring the cost of learning, it's a small, small proportion of the whole thing. Now, being a creature of research from time to time, I, I, I felt the need to fall upon a model that might support a little more, and many of you may have heard of the Kirkpatrick model, so I'm an advocate of that. It's a, it's a symbol uh, it, from, a, a, from, from investment-proof model. It's as good as you'll get. 
What, what Kirkpatrick said, said was that if you want to measure the effect, what it says, because he and his son are still working on this to my best of my knowledge, is that uh, if you want to measure the effect of training, you can do it in a number of ways. You can ask the learners how they feel. I'll come back to that in a moment. You can measure the cognitive change from a learning point of view. You can measure the behavioural change in the workplace. Or you could look at the overall results that come from that, um, from that, um, from the, the learning and development program. You could look at the organisational impact or results. So it's a good model. Um, and when I put it in, in another way, uh, you know, there are lots of ways to do it. I, I believe that, I think, you know, and I'm, I'm, if P, with PMI moving the PMP on is great because I think the, we, as we go forward, we realise um, the smile sheet. I, some of my clients will rely totally on the smile sheet as the proof of the value of the training. And I say, are you joking? Is seriously joking. I mean, I will get trained learning candidates who just can't be shifted anyway. At the end of the day, there's nothing you can do to move. But frankly, a proficient facilitator can change the quality of the smile sheet by focusing on a bit of class attention from afternoon tea onwards, quite frankly. So um, the smile sheet is an indicator. I use it more as a quality indicator to see if there's anything that I should fix in my training. Um, we can get to the examination component. We can do um, observation and review from a competency perspective to look at the behavioural change. We could use, we could use uh, IP, well, benchmarking methods, P OPM3, uh, Delta, maturity models to say, have we improved the overall organisational state? The issue with this is, um, let me go back, sorry, to there, is <coughs> the problem is this is about as far as most organisations can get. Um, and I like aligning to uh, aligning the, the uh, learning to a, to a formal certification framework because it gives, a, a, gives an external perspective to the return on investment. People will understand that they've gained an external level of accreditation. And if it's workplace based, so it's done in looking at actual change in, in, in practices, then we're not then just measuring the, the dollar value of the training, we're actually measuring the impact on the organisation. Look, the issue here, quite frankly, is most organisations don't have the data. If I said to most organisations, why are you embarking on a company-wide learning and development program uh, frankly, frankly, they would say because everyone else is doing it. Yeah, that's probably a bit glib. But, you know, that's not much below the level of proof. It's because there is an intrinsic belief in that. If I ask, but what are the performance indicators from a, from a corporate, pers corporate perspective that uh, indicate there's a need for the training? Frankly, there's a lack of data. If I, if they, if I said to them, or if, if they were researching and said, well, it's about schedule slippage, then the question would be, well, what's, what's the current level of schedule slippage? Because what we'd like to see at the end of the learning is whether that's improved. Ah, no, it's, well, it's about risk exposure. Okay, well, can we quantify that risk exposure so that we get some positive measures? But the, the trouble is, frankly, here is uh, there is a lack of data and uh, most organisations will stop at that. But look, it, it's... Linking to this, because the problem is without a focus on the benefits of a learning development program, frankly, everything's in lag indicator land. I'll say that again, you know, we're back in lag indicator land. We're doing the training because we've got problems. And one of the benefits of moving, measuring the benefits of training particularly, or learning, I should say learning and development, so let me get my own verbiage correct, is that we can move from the idea that learning and development is a cost centre to an actually more mature version that it's actually a profit centre. It's actually increasing the value of the company in a tangible way. Okay. That's, I'm going to move through those um, things on, on the return investment. We've talked enough. Okay, okay now, now, I need to ask a question. <coughs> Is it just <coughs> Australian? Do you all know the game Snakes and Ladders? Okay, just needed to check. I wasn't made sure that I wasn't just reaching into deep, a deep, dark 
Tasmanian childhood and bringing something out. <coughs> okay. A number of speakers yesterday, uh, the, uh, the Brazilian National Bank paper, Dennis and Darrell, were talking about sustainment. I think, Stacey, you talked about this as well. It's a factor that I, again, like to build into my consultancies, particularly when I'm developing enterprise project management frameworks, to say to an organisation, do you realise that we're going to spend significant effort here and we really need to focus on the sustainment factors as much as we do in the development factors? Because my experience in the past is, frankly, it's a game of snakes and ladders. You know the game? You roll the dice, you move forward. If you hit a ladder, you go up. If you hit a stake, you come down. And that's the way I've seen it. You, I don't need really to go through the organisation factors. You and I know what those factors are. A lot of whole range of things, but they're principally cultural. The, the biggest thing I find is the failure to embed a project management culture is what leads significantly towards the snakes and ladders game. So that, you know, we, and I, well, I, look, I should just shut up about it. Because I could come from being Australian to Austrian. I could say, I'll be back. <laughs> That's what I should say, is don't worry about sustainment. Just get David back. When, when you break your PMF, when you break the project management framework, I'll come back and fix it for you. That's what I should say. But I'm actually trying to develop an idea that it would, it's, it's, it's smart to build in the sustainment factors. Um, you know, but, and I, because I'm a simple soul, I like to put things simply. And there's more to this than meets the eye. I actually say to the organisations, you have to keep the ladders big and the snakes small. And there's more. I know that sounds like a glib statement. But if you think about it a little, there's more than that than meets the eye. That's, if we're looking at the enablers and, and the growth factors in maturity, look at ways of accelerating that. Look at ways of making big increases. If you understand the risks associated with, with non-sustainment of your project management framework, understand the risks. Reduce them, mitigate them, so that if something happens, you can control that, that loss of capability to the maximum extent possible. But frankly, it's the people, stupid. I think, am I allowed to use that term? I think it's a fairly well, fairly well known term. It, but it's organisation. Why, you know, why do, uh, you know, project manager, uh, MS project in Primavera, base camp, uh, my, uh, a project place, all of the systems, those systems, they don't break a project management framework. The things that break a project management framework are organisational and people are, and essentially cultural. So really, frankly, folks, that brings me back to the end of the, the, end, the end of this bit of a ramble story. But it's fantastic to see the discussion in this conference. And, and Mary and I are delighted, by the way. The hospitality we've received has been absolutely fantastic. Uh, we've loved being in Dallas, and we'll be sad, it'll be a sad moment below. Uh, we only then have to embark on a 15-hour flight back to Sydney, and then up to Brisbane. But so many of the papers here are encouraging because whilst I'm talking from history and saying that I've seen many examples where we could do better, it's clear that we are. We just have to focus on it. The more that we focus on the human capital component, understand how significant the human capital component is as a part of enterprise project management framework, and that the development of that project management framework needs to be done systematically. I've given you a few models. I'm sure you've seen others and maybe even better. But have a go. Do it systematically. And also understand that if you do it successfully, start to move into project management maturity levels four and five and focus on sustainment. And again, people, organisation and culture are key components there. So I'll stop here. It gives me exactly the 15 minutes required for questions. So. Um, one question. I'm just wondering if the keynote presentations are on our um, thumb drive. They are not at this stage because I was terribly naughty 
but, you, but it will, I'm sure it will be available for you, because it, it's, it's here now. When I get home, my wife is going to ask me about what got talked about today. She has the experience some years ago of going in front of a client sponsor, and he began the meeting by saying, I don't want to hear the word scope creep, just to get the relationship off on the right foot. So when I tell her, well, I heard a guy from Australia come out, and he talked about getting sponsors into project management culture. I predict that she'll be very interested, and she'll say something like, how exactly does he propose to do that? What should my answer be? Uh, the answer is, um, they have to be developed in exactly the same way. Um, I spent some time for BHP developing a training program for sponsors, and we've used it several times. Um, and I think the comment was made in other papers. The issue there, of course, is time. The most difficult thing I found from the perspective of educating sponsors, it's interesting, we ran this earlier this year with a client. Uh, could you match, we've just developed a project management framework, can you tell us what our matching human capa uh, uh, competency capability is? And we gave them the response that your general competency level is below par and we'll need to increase if you want to sustain the PMF, and in particular we need to, to do that. But then it became a debate, a debate, on how long it would take to educate the sponsors. I started with my big call of, can you give me a day? And by the time we all stopped laughing, I took the pitch down to half a day, and then it became two hours. Um, and so we're still waiting for the results. But they have to, you know, they have to do formal education as well. And I personally, I must say the most encouraging thing I saw it was during my time in Chile with BHP Bulletin, is the number of senior managers who attended the basic learning program as leadership exemplars for the organisation. So it does have to be done through learning and development and other factors, in, in my humble opinion. That's a joke, by the way, in my humble opinion. So. Here. Please, please, yes. Yeah, one of the things that It's difficult. Yeah, it is. Uh, we've actually done some work in mapping project management practices to, to, to both those uh, both those frameworks, Eitel and uh, and, and uh, Six Sigma Lean. Uh, it's easy to do. I think you've got to. Well, my personal view on that is just a quick response. To, you have to understand the comparison yourself. I think the only my tendency would be to do it in a one-on-one -on -one discussion to explain the similarity. But if an organisation is embedded in uh, Six Sigma uh, and lean practices, then I'm not sure you're going to shake them out just through a single recruitment interview. I must say the funniest thing that had happened was in a program in Malaysia with the Malaysian airports holding their heart. It was, I was put this mapping together to deliver a program to their lean practitioners. And I was told, you are going to get all of our black belt lean, lean practitioners and, uh, and I want you to give them some, some bridging education in project management. And the irony was, the irony was that um, the people that turned up were absolute numpties in lean alone. I mean, I, they didn't have black belt lean, six, six sigma people. It was just, so it was a bit of a mess. Uh, I ran the program in any case, but it certainly wasn't the program that I envisaged. Hey, Dave. Hey, Dave. Uh, in America, we like to avoid conflict, and one of the ways we do that is by promoting people up to upper management where they can presumably do less damage. I think that explains our current vice president. Uh, we don't seem to have a problem with buy-in for all these processes at the project management level. We're going out and we're getting these certifications and we're buying into it. Where we're seeing problems is with upper management. 
How do you address getting senior level managers to buy into this so it actually becomes a top down culture within a company and not just PMs beating at the door while, while they, play, they, they keep the castle locked off? Uh, thanks, Vince. Look, uh, you, it's got to be done. I would prefer to do a consultancy with an executive brief and, and have them buy into the whole concept of the project management framework. But I think the only way of truly explaining that to you would be to give you the experience of um, earlier this year. I've done, we've done some significant work with uh, local governments in, in, in my state, in Queensland. And on one, one question, we had a proposition that a particular audit result required the audit methodology made it imperative that the organisation had a project management framework written and in place in three months. Well, you've got to laugh at that. You're the only thing you can do. But, you know, we wrote a, we wrote a bid, a, client, a colleague and I, and we, we, we delivered it. And we made the client clear. We were very clear with the client about what we would and wouldn't deliver and, and all the other things needed. The interesting aspect was that when we got to the point of the PMO and the higher level skills, and the governance, the governance alignment. <coughs> At the sponsor level in our brief, when we got to the stage just before briefing the chief executive and the chief financial officer, they were scared out of their shoes because they said, we buy into everything you've said, but the executive are going to kill you tomorrow when you give your presentation. And we gave the presentation, and the chief financial officer was applauding, you know, when we were into our second slide, and the chief executive was delighted. And his response was, we're going to do all of this. The only question is how and when, but we commit to it. So that's the best response I can give you, but it, I prefer the briefs to be given top down. Please. One of the best ways we found out, and this is why Daryl and I have written the book we have, is by example. Our, our case study books are, are about people, about organizations, and how their executives, how do you sell them on the idea? And these aren't just small, they're 30 to 40 to 50 pages of detail. And that's what, if you, if you can lay it in front of your executive people and say, hey, look what other people are doing. These other, all these other industries are, are, are adopting and embracing at the executive level. That's how come they're so successful. That's how you, how you sell the idea. Thank you. Exemplars, and from Bill's presentation this morning, uh, a lot of the data that's showing the improvements in organizations, thank you. I think that sort of benchmarking information is critical, um, and it's our desire, I must say, from a business as much as anything else, uh, perspective is to launch a benchmarking framework in Australia very much for that reason, so that in critical areas um, you can show things through the proof of the pudding. Yeah, absolutely. So, to the point of benchmarking with regard to organizational maturity, there are pockets of excellence in different organizations, right? There's certain project management groups that excel and do very well. How do you then leverage that and say, so we've got one group that does very well, executes at a high level, and then we have other groups that don't. So people are along the continuum of the organizational maturity model that you were showing. So how do you then leverage that? We need this group to teach this group. Do you move people around? Um. In a lot of cases, so you're talking internally? Okay. In the main, my experience has been that uh, most organisations best their project management behaviours in one part of the organisation. So that doesn't occur so often, but when it does, we do it with great sensitivity because the last thing we want to do is rub people's noses you know, in the mud. So it's, that's, thank you for the question because it's a, it's a tricky area. One has to be really supremely careful moving into that space. You need to know the organisational impact points there, the real hurt points, and uh, who will get their nose out of joint when you do that. Having solved that, yes. Um, I haven't done it so much in terms of moving people around, but using that part of the organisation as an exemplar and a benchmark and moving their practices in is part of the practice. But with great sensitivity, because it's an area that you can destroy uh, all the work within an organisation if that particular discussion becomes a sore point. Okay. There you go. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Bill, for reminding us that uh, there's more to conference than just <laughs>
Thank you for coming all the way off right here. We really appreciate it. It's my job.